All right. Happy Thursday, everybody. Very excited for today's panel. We're going to dive behind the scenes of what it looks like barriers, blockers, opportunities behind high performing cast practices. We have a couple questions to go through. We're going to be pulling everybody uh, to get a gauge of, of what they're thinking of. Um, but first, Let's do a quick audio video check. So you should see myself, you should see Kane, you should see Deneen here on the screen. And let us know where you're calling in from. Are you calling in from a, I'm going to call it a tropical Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I have I have team members that are closer to Philly and they have a foot of snow, yet it's 50 degrees here. So are you in, are you in snow land? Are you in um, sun land? Let us know where you're calling in from and uh, make sure that you can hear us and see us. So go ahead and type into uh, the chat or the Q&A. Let us know that uh, everything is A-OK. -okay. We're going to dive into a quick round of intros here in just a second, and then we're going to prompt some questions. Um, but go ahead and type into uh, either the chat or the Q&A. Let us know where you're calling in from, and if it's if it's sunny, if it's snowy, or if it's somewhere in between, let us know. We'll do a quick sanity sanity check. So well, we, we have, have a non- All we have is check-ins. It's just, I come from Latro, Pennsylvania. And so that's where I grew up in snowy Pennsylvania land. And I went to Pitt. I think we talked about this. Yeah. Um, and now I'm in sunny Florida. So don't anybody hate me, <laughs> but I do miss the snow. Well, you, you know, you could have been in Detroit today because we just got about three inches of snow in the last hour. So uh, you're more than welcome to come back up here. <laughs> I miss it, but no, thank you. <laughs> I, I tell you what, it feels it feels like I'm in Florida right now. It's 50 up here. If, you know, if you're in Pittsburgh right now, people are going to be walking around in shorts. I think people are going to be working on their tans today. <laughs> this is this is not normal for us. Uh, so we got somebody calling in from Tampa, Florida, so they get the sun mm -hmm. and the tax break. Um, Atlanta, <laughs> sunny down here, snowy here. I, who knows where you are? If you're saying snowy here, it could be any. I was talking with somebody two weeks ago in Alabama it was snowing. So I don't know where that is anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, somebody said sunny Arizona, Jenny from California. Good to see you. Um, yep. Go ahead and type it in the Q and a for folks asking about chat. If you just throw the question in there, somebody's calling in from Edmonton. Fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm really excited about today's topic. I really appreciate everybody joining us on this, on this Thursday morning or afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. And, um, uh, before we do a quick round of introductions, wanted to talk about you know, why we prompted this panel in the first place. Now, we've been seeing in the ecosystem time and time again that when folks invest or start cast practices, and we're going to dig into what does that even mean? We're going to dig into that a little bit uh, beforehand, but your your, your level of, of client satisfaction increases, your level of profitability, certainly for the service can, 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 can be tremendous and the growth can be tremendous. And so it's really become a growth engine for a lot of firms, big and small, to invest in this area, but sometimes it's really hard to kind of get into the weeds and say, well, what are some of the best practices? What are some of the traps? What are some of the things that we should be aware of as we're as we're starting or scaling up in the wonderful world of CAS? And so uh, I, I really appreciate everybody that had asked questions in advance. We will be pulling from some of those today uh, as I hand this off to, to, to Kane and Deneen. But as questions come up, this is the beauty of being here live ask away. So that Q&A section, type in your cues. We'll try to get through as many as possible. Again, I have some boilerplate ones, but I want it to be extremely relevant for everybody who invested the time to be here alive. So be sure to utilize that question section. So having said all that, my name is David Costello. I'm the founder and CEO of Jetpack Workflow. We help firms standardize their client work so that nothing falls through the cracks. I'm excited to bring on Kane and Deneen. Uh, so let's go ahead and kick it off with a quick intro, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start it off with some questions. Kane, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, sure, Kane Polkoff. I'm still disappointed that the uh, Detroit Lions did not make it to the Super Bowl, David. So, uh, I mean, it's unfortunate, maybe next year. So, uh, yeah, I've been in, uh, in this space for about 28 years. Uh, consulting, uh, business process outsourcing. I've been part of the CAST uh, network for the last six, six and a half years. And uh, I run the uh, CAST practice at uh, Cohen Resnick. So we're uh, a top 20 uh, public accounting firm. We've got about 5,500 employees here in, in the U.S., over 1,200 in Chennai, India. And we just set up our Philippines operation. So uh, excited to be here. I've had a lot of fun. I've Started at my own cast at UHY, my previous organization from scratch, and kind of going through the same thing here. So I've had a lot of experience, a lot of things to learn and share with everybody on the call. So pleasure to be here. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for joining us, uh, Deneen. 
Yes, hi. Thank you, David, for inviting me to, to talk today about CAS. My name is Deneen Dias. I'm Vice President of Growth and Strategic Relationships at Botkeeper. Um, Botkeeper is an AI company that comes in and only works with accounting firms in coding of transactions. Uh, and so we've had massive growth with CAS firms that really want to grow um, their client base, their, their CAS client base. Um, previous to Botkeeper, I've been here going on, can you believe it, Kane, almost four years. Uh, I was at CPA.com. Wow for 13 years where I helped firms build a cloud-based CAS practice. Uh, so I ran the Intact Accountants Program, the Build.com Accountants Program. Um, CPA.com has a CAS workshop that I used to facilitate. And so I have never done what Kane has done. And you're, I'm, I'm loving watching you do it again, Kane, because he's a builder of CAS practices. Um, but my perspective is working with hundreds of firms that have successfully, as well as had challenge, challenges building a CAS practice. And so um, I look forward to the discussion today. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, let's set the foundation. Um, there's there's a couple of questions early on, which is how would you define CAS? And there, there's a related one here, which is when is it, when is it, it, you know, client accounting? When is it client advisory? And what really distinguishes the differences? So let's just start with some basic definition before we get into some of the more more advanced questions, if you will. All right, I guess you want me to start? I can yeah, start. go ahead. So, uh, so I, I think it, in the last year, we've made it official that we, we call CAS, C-A-S, Client Advisory Services, where the A, which is silent for accounting, is not there. So accounting is assumed. Um, you still see C-A, you know, A-S as well. But, uh, you know, really the definition where, where it's continued to evolve, which is pretty exciting, is uh, you know, I look at it from three perspectives is the way, the way I define it. So you have it from a people process and technology side. So for CAS, on the people side, we're really becoming an extension of our client's accounting department. So that could mean you know, doing the transactional work, uh, doing financial statement preparation, reconciliations, getting into advisory, which we'll talk more about business insights and really helping to advise our clients to move forward. So that's on the people side. So we have Folks that are part of, of our team that have been in the industry for 25, 30 years, former CFOs, controllers, have done also public accounting. It's kind of a mix, which is, uh, I think, very exciting. And also, we can talk more about individuals that really didn't have an accounting degree have come in, like engineers or mathematicians and things like that. We could talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then on the technology side, and, and I know Botkeeper is one from a, a service provider and a solution, There, uh, there's been a lot of... Uh, great uh, innovation in the technology side. So you, know, you have a, a general ledger system, typically, you, you, I like to say a tech stack by vertical. So mm -hmm. you know, whether you're in the real estate or hospitality or non-for-profit or renewable energy, you have, there are certain GLs that are more specific based on the uh, the industry, which then you have AP automation, you have PNA, you have business intelligence. So it's really a foundation. So in CAS, we like to standardize our tech stack to be able to provide accounting services to our clients. And so we even implement technology solutions for our clients. And then lastly, on the, uh, the process side, is automation and efficiency is a key thing. But as, as providing accounting services, we want to have the right controls in place from a separation of duties, policies and procedures, SOPs. So as we work with uh, clients, they don't have that normal, that sophistication or add that information. So we're helping to provide that. So. So that's kind of in my my definition. It's continuing to evolve, and which is exciting. But that's really the foundation from my perspective. So, Danae, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else there. Yeah, I mean, Kane, you just gave everybody your business plan, basically, of how to build a cast practice because you covered all the key areas. And so that's coming from somebody who has done it and is doing it really well at a top one hundred firm. I would tell you, though, the majority of the firms out there are not as advanced and evolved as Kane. And so my answer is, it depends. Because when I talk to hundreds, now thousands of firms, I ask them, what does CAS mean to you? And I can tell immediately if they're new to it, if they're three years in building a CAS practice, or if they're a mature CAS practice because of their answer. And so that client advisory services practice is the mature CAS practice answer. I think the ones that are just starting out are starting out calling it client accounting and advisory services. Um, and so it depends. The firms are defining it in different ways. They're building it in different ways and they don't 
always have um, the talent that and people and the processes yet. Um, I think where it's going is where Kane is. And so now that I've worked with firms over the last 15 years, ones that are mature are dropping the two A's and are going to that advisory space because that's where the revenue is. And that's really what the clients need the help with. Uh, it takes some time to get there though. Yeah, I love the idea of it being a, a, a maturity model almost of you're progressing into eventually get to the place where you have the silent A. I'm going to start using that more and more often. Kim. I like the, the silent A. The silent, the silent A. Well, there was a question and, and you both touched on it a little bit, we, we, you know, from the audience leading up to this. And again, keep asking questions. We're going to dive into those. I see some good ones uh, uh, coming up. Um, but we had some questions around how to specialize. So there was somebody I know that when they had registered, they said, well, you know, we really feel like family office could be a really great place for us to focus. But then what does that look like operationally to position the firm to be really, really great for supporting family office? I'm going to take that first, Kane, and then I think you're going to have a more mature answer. Um, when I was at CPA.com, that was part of the CAS workshop was specialization. Um, and as you're you know, building your CAS practice, you should be building it by vertical. Firms struggle with that out of the gate because traditionally in the bookkeeping space, firms are special or, or generalist. They are generalist and they are being sent leads from the tax department traditionally to help get the tax work done. And so they've needed to be generalist. But as they've started to build up a CAS practice, which is not bookkeeping, it's more of doing the advisory work you need to start specializing and you also will win business if you are a specialist by vertical because you're going to really understand what the client needs and you can speak the client's language and you can bring in controllers and CFOs for family offices that know how to specialize in that vertical. Um, so I think, again, that is very hard for firms to start off by just specializing because they're getting leads that they're turning away. And the other partners don't like that. They don't like that they're being told, no, that's that's not that's not in my vertical. So it's really hard to start there. But as you grow and mature and you bring in more talent, and I also think as firms are also getting private equity, the acquisitions and mergers are happening, we're going to see specialization becoming super important uh, in this space in the next, especially in the next couple of years. Before passing to Kane, I just had a quick follow-up, Deneen, in, in the firms that you've seen, is there a tipping point whereby the CAS department has enough resources to really methodically specialize? Is it like seven-figure run rate or 500K a year or two million or, or you know, a rough range where it's like, okay, now we can actually exhale a little bit. This is going right. to work, but we need to like put in yes. more infrastructure. Um, I, I would say as I see firms grow CAS, what as, and I would say this is about the three-year point. Right, where they, they're a generalist, they take any client, um, they do it the client's way, and then all of a sudden they realize that's not scalable and as profitable as it could be. So then they start saying no to the wrong type clients. They get very clear on their right type client. That tends to be around revenue. So initially I see firms starting cast around 1,000, maybe 2,000 per client per month. Uh, but then as they start bringing in the 4,000, 5,000, $10,000 per month client, then they're able to say, oh, we need to free up where at capacity, we need to free up our talent to continue to bring in these $10,000 a month clients. And we're going to let go of these $1,000 a month clients that aren't profitable. And that's where they start bringing in talent. Then they can specialize in these $10,000 per month clients from a controllership and CFO perspective um, and afford them, right? And, and then focus on, on that vertical. Um, so I don't know if it's a, I don't think I answered it the way you asked, but <laughs> I think it's a different type of revenue discussion. And I think it's also a decision that that tipping point, you know, I say three years in, they're now uh, coming across problems, right? That, that things aren't going like they thought it, it, they would. And you have to start putting processes, procedures, saying no to the wrong type of business, specializing, verticalizing, um, so it's different than a revenue perspective. It's sort of like a maturity journey. I, and can you get really quiet? Um, you've you've done it. Um, I'm curious to see um, what your answers are or you know what you're seeing. 
Well, maybe I'll, I'll start on the, uh, the family office question and then David, you can. So, you know, my, my first that, you know, I, when I built, you know, the cat sparks from scratch, we were, uh, we became, we were generalists. Yeah. So, you know, the firm was in the process of kind of developing the industry specifics, but, you know, we found that, you know, just being a generalist allowed us the ability to, to grow and take on accounts. So, uh, and, uh, However, as we kind of evolved uh, in there, we found out we did have to specialize and identify because uh, clients are expecting you to understand their business, whether it's a you know, restaurant or a non for profit or renewable energy client, and understand the nomenclature and be able to, you know, there's a difference in, in margins when you run a, a restaurant versus a renewable energy client. There's different types of needs and regulations and, and things like that, as an example. So so we had to kind of move towards that, that angle. Um, the second time around, uh, I, I built it from from the beginning with with industry. So, uh, and and the way I did it was looking at our at our firm and determining what are the key industries, where's the growth, and where are areas that we think that there's the biggest need in the marketplace, and and kind of hired individuals that have that expertise and kind of went from there. Uh, your your question on, on on revenue, I mean it's it's a subjective question because it you know it depends on the size of the organization. So you know, kind of my expectation within, you know, my firm may be different than somebody else's and uh, which, the, but however, the good news is whether it's a, you know, a thousand dollar a month client or a $150,000 a month client, if you're able to have uh, standardization uh, technology in place and, and the right people, you can make it very profitable. Yeah. So I think that's the key. And when you look at the family office, which is a, a growing market, you know, there's a lot of tools out there that tailor to that. And uh, you know, security is important when it comes to that. And you have a lot of integration. They have many different entities you find out. So you want to make sure you use the right platform. But you, yep. if that's where you want to go about, you want to make sure that you have the right, the right people to support that, the right technology stack to to execute on that, and then the right people that understand it. So, so I think that would be my 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 answer to those uh, two questions. So. Yeah. Well, before before diving in, I, again, I keep I keep alluding to these questions, so keep asking them. I'll ask one more and a big question. We'll take one from the audience here in a second. But kind of jumping off, you know, uh, uh, Kenya talked about what you did at UHY and how it's, you know, what's the same, what's different. You know, there's a question of what are some of the most common um, attributes of a successful cast practice. So. Um, I'll kind of pose this question in this way. So, uh, Kane, maybe there's something that you did in UHY. You're like, we have to do it this exact same way in Cohen, or we did it this way, but here's how we're going to flip it for Cohen, maybe similar to what you just mentioned, to accelerate our growth faster. And then, Denise, same same perspective, right? So in all the cast practices you worked with at CPA.com and at Botkeeper, you know, the ones that are growing the fastest, what have they discovered early on that's kind of ignited their growth? So. So, so what what I did the same was uh, not try to take on too many different technology uh, solutions. So trying to be specific, looking at one or two general ledgers within the verticals, because if you have three or four or five, it's harder to train, it's harder to scale, and and trying to limit uh, the mm -hmm. tech stack to to take on maybe eighty percent of the work if that makes sense. Because you can't have all these one-offs because it's, it's really hard to, to leverage your capacity to be able to grow and to be able to scale. So I think that that's definitely a thing. The, the second thing that that I did, which is maybe unique, is I actually uh, built it. You, you, you've ever seen the Field of Dreams. If you built it, they will come, right? So you know all the, all the cars and everybody are coming. Hopefully they had enough room to put all those people at the end of the movie. But you want to make sure the same kind of thing. There's such a demand in the marketplace right now for what we do. Yeah. It's really hard to hire as you're taking on work because you have you have to of course you have to recruit you got to onboard you got to train and then you got to get them up and running, and 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 we were fortunate in, in both situations that I was able to bring in the right resources and get them situated in in our processes before all that work came in. I see a lot of challenges in the marketplace where people are not doing that, and what happens is a degradation and, and delivery and escalations and which is unfortunately going to impact a bad reputation and, and doing things like that. So that that's something uh, that you know I follow. Now what I've done differently, what I've learned is you know just you know creating those verticals, which is such a critical thing is making that investment of hiring the or having the, the key directors that are running each of those mm -hmm. verticals that have the deep knowledge, understand the business, 
and and, and they're able to really jump right in. And, and it's funny when you're on a prospect call um, in non for profit, Laura's our director who leads it. She's immediately speaking the same language yeah. with the prospects and understanding the pain points. And it just it just makes not only the, the sales process easier, but the execution of the work. And you know, we're we're a couple steps ahead of the client in a good way. Instead of trying to learn from the client, we want the client to learn from us. Yeah. And I think having that uh, having that in place was very important. Um, the second thing that I've done differently too is is leveraging a global capacity. So uh, my first stint, I, everything was done here within the U.S., uh, predominantly in a couple of offices here. I have a global capacity, and I was just sharing with you before the call. I've been in, I've been to India twice in the last three months, uh, and uh, building that capacity here in the U.S., which is so critical, but also in our Chennai operation, and now we're setting up our Philippines operation. It's, it's, it's just really important. It's one team supporting each other, and as we kind of continue to grow, we're able to add people and and support that need that's in the marketplace. So those are a couple of those things, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things I can spend the, the next two, yeah. three hours talking about, but I think those are at least maybe a couple of things just uh, that as I reflect on your questions. I love that. I love that. Deneen, what have you seen in your all your work across the, across the firms? Yeah. So number one is leadership support. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I talk to a lot of firms that will tell me they have leadership support, but then as the cast leader tries to start building it, they do not have leadership support. The leadership is hearing that other firms are growing these cast practices and it's 20% growth and it's very profitable and it's the fastest growing revenue source for the firm. So we want you to go do it. And they will tend to pick a tax partner, an audit partner, a partner to start a CAS practice, but they still have one foot in audit or one foot in tax. And so you can't have that CAS leader be distracted from building CAS. And so really having a dedicated leader that is like Kane, whose sole job is to build CAS and revenue for CAS and having your tax and audit and managing partner aligned with that is that cast leader's job <laughs> and their only job and that they have a seat at the leadership table. Because what I see at a lot of firms is in smaller firms, maybe you have 10 tax partners, 10 audit partners and half a cast partner. Well, they don't really have a seat at the table and that cast partner has to do things differently. They have to price differently. They have to staff differently. They have to bring in different technology that the firm is right now using. So they need to have a budget. And so they need to have a business plan and they need to have goals and they need to have measurable goals because sometimes I'll hear that the cast person's revenue is tied up in tax somewhere and it's not really clear what the cast revenue is. And, and so leadership support, cast leader um, is the number one, I think, uh, uh, I don't want to say pain point. Mm -hmm. But I think blocker from really blowing it out. Yeah, and I'm going to chime in. I know you have others, but real quickly, I would, you know, I would second that, you know, completely. I think that, you know, talking to a lot of the other cast leaders in the industry, I know that you know, Deneen and I have the opportunity of doing that quite often during the year. It's, there's still a lot of challenges out there with a lot of the cast leaders are, you know, they're not allowed to. I guess they're not making the right investments and in, from the people and the technology to to grow. And I think that. It's unfortunate. So, I mean, we've seen that, especially in the last couple of years. I think it's getting better. I think it's it more is. people are becoming aware of what uh, what we can do as a, as an industry from a cast perspective. It's it's allowing more investment, but there's still a lot of cases where some of the cast practices are being moved under areas of within a firm that's not appropriate. That uh, they're they're focusing in the wrong areas. So you're looking only at utilization, realization, and yep. Not uh, not understand that the business is a little bit different than a, a t a tax and insurance, and you have to run it differently. And right. uh, and I think you're right, uh, I mean There are cases where if you bring in a, I don't know. I mean, I have a full time job just alone to focus on cash, and I mean, I know how many hours I work. But uh, to imagine and be a tax partner to be able to do, there's no way you could be successful. And and everybody on our team, is, and I think you're probably going to say this too, is is dedicated 100 percent to cash also. So we don't we're not sharing. The with, uh, the tax, with, yeah. with, with the tax group, um, we t we do take people in or back forth that are that want to move to our our transfer, vice versa. But you have to have a dedicated team that's there. I mean, it's an, it's a long term relationship with our clients. You can't just keep moving people in that, in and out. And we're talking to our clients daily, sometimes mm -hmm. three four times a day. 
And that's the value is it allows us to really get to know and become an extension of the team. So that allows us to cross sell and upsell and do a lot of other things that the firm wants. So sorry if anybody just wanted to validate. No, oh, that that validates, you know, that 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 that's I mean, it's just a pain point that I've seen firms like have really talented people really want to build this. And and at times they're just really handicapped. And so having that leadership support, that managing partner support, and having the the other team really understand that this is different and it's going to take a lot, it's not your typical um, you know, pricing and staffing and stuff and be committed uh, to supporting. And I like what you said, Kane, is separating, right? You cannot have your people who are talking to the clients every single day, every single week during tax season disappear for three months because that's reoccurring month after month revenue instead of where tax is like annual revenue, right? CAS is really profitable month after month, 12 months out of the year, reoccurring revenue. And you can't have those people all of a sudden disappear for three months and then come back. Um, they, they, and then, then you're stretching your staff too thin and staff have two jobs and it just, it, it, it doesn't work. Yeah, these are these are great points. I want to grab some of the audience questions here. We had one from Hassan who said, how do you organize internal staffing on an engagement? Is it how much revenue each staff manages or is there some other ratio or metric as you think about organizing your, your team? I mean, I think you want me to take that one. I do. Yeah. <laughs> so you think about, you know, we're, you, you have to look at capacity. So the second step way back is we have uh, 12 week forecasting that we do. So forecasting with our existing business, um, we look at our pipeline and then we look at within the pipeline, the prospects, and we, we identify based on the type of opportunity is what is the resource requirement? You know, for example, client A is uh, we're going to be doing accounts payable. Here's how many invoices it will be. Here's the type of tool it'll be in. Um, we're going to need to do reconciliations of, of three bank, um, bank accounts. Uh, we're going to have to do... Uh, a monthly close within 10 business days and, you know, X, Y, Z. So there's a, a bunch of assumptions and questionnaires that we put together to get that input that helps them to define what type of, uh, how much time it's going to take to do the job. So since we are an annuity, um, as we say, month over month, you have the existing capacity. You want to make sure the utilization and the capacity is adjusted to, to what we need. But for the new accounts, as they come up, you know, we, we're, we're trying to identify, you may have one client that needs 10 people fully dedicated. We have that. And you have, they have one client that it's only 40 hours a, a month of work. So, you know, we have a resource management group and, and, and maybe because we have a larger organization, you know, I have that advantage where we, that, that sole purpose is really to look at the resources, look at the skill sets of the team, understanding the capacity, and then to assign individuals within our verticals to be able to move in there. Now, as we go through the sales process, we do do recruiting. So uh, we're, we're continuing to build our capacity and uh, try to be ahead of the game. So as we look at this one account that may need 120 hours and 40 of that is AP and, and the rest, then I'm able, we're able to sign that staff to support that. Or we look at existing jobs and find out as we continue to automate or become more optimized that we can free up that capacity of some of those individuals and move them into uh, the new opportunity. So it's... Uh, it's a complicated thing. Um, it's not simple. I mean, that's an area we spend a lot of time on and we evaluate. But, you know, one person may only be able to do one account and that's fine if, if it's so there's not a right or rule that one person has to do three accounts or five accounts. It really depends on the size and the skill set of that need. So, you know, it's just like staffing anything. You really need to. The nice thing about it is the work once it's stabilized, it's consistent. So you can look at that. But up front, you normally have to. Uh, have buffer capacity because it's going to take more time to learn and understand what you're doing. So that's kind of the methodology. And there's many ways. I mean, I know some people use spreadsheets. You know, we have a tool that helps us with that. So some, you know, some of you on the phone that are are on the call that are they're smaller. You just need to come up with some kind of formula and structure and how you're going to do that. And and it really is a science and an art to get yeah. to be able to do that. So yeah, the the thing that you, and you touched on it, but I want to. I want to dig in a bit more is the automation and the technology because I work for an AI company. AI is coming into the space fast and furious, right? Blackkeeper has been in this space for eight years, but there are new AI co companies coming out now that are going to automate the job. 
And so it's the value to the client, I believe. And I'll give you an example. I worked uh, with Christine Triantos at BDO. She had a very large client that her team was servicing in a certain vertical. And it was taking her team 130 hours a week uh, to do a certain thing for this large client. And she went to her team and she said, find me tech, find me tech. I want to automate it. And one of her team members, and that was like, she compensated her team members on finding tech. And if they implemented the technology with throughout the firm, that person got bonus big. Um, and so she found a tech that automated that 130 hours into 30 minutes. Now she's charging the client the same amount because the value to the client is the same amount. Um, but I just, I say that automation and that tech, and I'm glad you said, King, you're constantly reevaluating it. Because even if you can spend less hours doing it because you've automated it, doesn't mean that the value and the price to the client doesn't stay. Um, and that's what they're bringing you in to do. They want your expertise. They want your people. They want your process. They want your tech. They can't go out there and find it. You can. And so they don't care how you do the work. They just want you to do it well. <laughs> and they want other things from you than just doing the work. They want your guidance. They want your advice. They want you to be helping them make business decisions. And so if you get all of that data automated and you're able to now see the data in a way that allows you to advise on the data is truly the value to the client that the, the, the client will pay more for. And yeah. I'm yeah. really passionate about that case. No, no, <laughs> and it's great. We have reports that show variances and projections. So we can see every, every day or every week the variances for each of the projects and who's assigned. So you know, as you look at those variances and, and you see that that allows us to, to adjust and, and to update our capacity. So it is an ongoing thing. That's, I mean, that's one of the secrets of how to manage is it's how do you staff your team appropriately with the right skill sets too. And, you know, coming up with the benchmarking and, and, and I think you said it right, you know, Deneen, for AP, it's a very manual process for most clients, but there's a lot of tools out there that can really right. reduce and make things more efficient move more of the, of the uh, suppliers to electronic means. And so there's a lot of things that you can do. And, and so it's, it's, it's an ongoing continuous improvement, as I like to say. It's like our job, and I have somebody on my team, all she is, her focus is, is automation, improvements, and she's working across our verticals to, to try to find areas to, to, to reduce the manual intervention and to make things match quicker and, and to make things better for everybody so that our capacity continue to grow with our existing staff too. And so that's how you kind of leverage it. And it's, a, it is, a, it is a challenging piece of our business for sure. Yeah. I love those points. Yeah. I, and I, but before we move on, I just want to highlight, I love Deneen's point about, you know, continuing to invest in automation because there's so much going on in the industry in terms of productivity savings. And, and can, I love that you think, about capacity deeply coupled with the sales process. And you're really having this collaboration, it sounds like, between fulfillment and sales on what this engagement is going to look like and how you can potentially uh, uh, service it. Uh, on a somewhat related note, we had Karen from Maryland ask us about cast pricing and time and billing. Um, you know, she might come from, or if I'm reading this correctly, from a traditional old school framework versus, uh, and I take that as more of the, more of the hourly billing, um, and and how should how should folks think about the billing formats more closely aligned with cast pricing and, and what have you seen work well uh, either across firms or for you individually? I I like Denise. I'll take that first. Yeah. So I think that you know, billing is an art form too, and and I think everybody does it a little bit differently. But I think the the most important thing is to make sure you scope your opportunity correct. Whether you do flat, you know, flat monthly fee, whether you do time and materials or value based, you know, billing, all that you hear. But I think one of the key things is really understanding the scope that you're going to have to do for a new account. And and I said this, you know, to a lot of individuals, a client is always going to underestimate the amount of work that's required to do the job, right. and that that happens all the time. So if there's things up in the process of, uh, you know, looking under the hood, you're looking at their systems, looking at how they do the work reviewing, you know, getting really and spending that time up to scope it right the first time, that's going to help alleviate having to go back and ask for more money or, or whatever that may be later on. So, you know, one of the approaches you can take is you know, always start off with time and materials initially because the scope, there's a fluctuation on what's going to happen. Um, not, you can't always do that because the client may not always agree. 
But then the first three months is really a time for getting to the point, getting up and running, learning the business, stabilizing, and then move to a point of a flat fee if that's if that's what the client wants. And that's where, you know, Denine, you made that comment where if you're able to optimize and reduce your, your cost, then your margins will continue to increase, right? right. So that's assuming it's scoped correctly. So so I, I keep it very simple. It's, you know, time and materials and move to a flat fee if they want to. But I also see that there's always new opportunities, new type of, they acquire a new company, they they add another bank account. They, they so right. there's a lot of fluid fluidity there. So you just really have to determine what type of client you're working with to help you know, determine what the right approach is. And, and you have to be comfortable with that. You want to make sure you build enough margin up front and you, you build that buffer capacity. And knowing that you will be making an investment the first two, three months mm -hmm. because of the time of learning that the margins and everything will should start improving after month four. But you also want to protect yourself. Because so I hear talking to so many of the other cast leaders in the industries where they end up losing a bunch of money the first three months. Yeah. And it's hard to recover. So you do want to make sure you scope that up correctly. Yeah, I agree. You know, TPA.com, uh, we call that doing the discovery, mm -hmm. right? And spending the time discovering the client, um, their, their people, their process, um, their tools, their technology, where their inefficiencies are, where, you know, their team is inefficient. And so you've got to get under the hood. You have to ask all the questions in order to be able to price the client. And I think a lot of firms price differently in CAS. It's like, this is what we charge for payroll. This is what we charge for bill pay. This is what we charge, right? And so instead of like, first, really understanding the client and their needs, that ex I always use the example of when my car is broken, right? You, I take it to the shop and when I get there, they don't tell me what their, their costs are. They have to get under the hood and they have to see what's broken. And then they call me and say, this is what's broken and this is what it's going to cost to fix it. Your clients are coming to you because they're broken. Something is broken. Maybe they've outgrown what they have now and they need your help to take them to the next level. Um, and so they're coming to you because something's broken. So you can't tell them how you're going to fix them until you really get under the hood and do that assessment, do that scoping, do that discovery. And I always recommend firms charge for it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of firms are getting more comfortable at charging for it. Initially, they, they balk at the idea of charging for, you know, I'm going to charge you before you're my client just to do a discovery to find out what's broken. Well, that's your differentiator because they're shopping and they're looking at different firms. And so the differentiator is like, hey, I can't tell you how I'm going to fix you until I really dig in and find out what's broken. And my services are expensive. So I need to charge for that work. Now, you need to give them a deliverable. Here's all the broken things that I found. And here's how I want to fix it. And here's the technology I want to use to fix it. And here's the processes we're going to switch you to because you have to get on our standardized methodology. Um, but I do think you should charge for that discovery because um, clients will value that you want to spend time getting to know them. And you can also say, I'm going to tell you not just what's broken, but I'm going to tell you what's working and we're going to keep what's working, right? We're not going to change you drastically if it's working, but you're coming to me because something's broken. Yeah. And, and we're selling value, we're not selling a commodity. I think, uh, you know, yeah. to your and I think people... We need to we need to have that mindset as we meet with our clients that you know, we're providing a tremendous amount of value to you, and and I, and I agree we we do charge for assessments and Good. doing like what you said, uh, and and you don't want to work with a client that's just looking for the lowest price because yeah. they're going to get what they they pay for. And we've seen cases in a situation where we hold ourselves to a certain standard, and if they decide to go somewhere else, you know we wish them the best of luck. But we've seen a lot of cases they come back to us. They come back because they get what they pay for. So you know, I think all of us on this call is just understand the value you do provide. It don't don't try to negotiate with yourself. So, so um, I, I'm going to try to thread the needle here. I don't know if this has ever been done before on a Zoom panel. I'm going to try to pull two questions and turn them into one. We'll see if I'm successful or not. Um, somebody asked. How do you feel CAS needs to 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 be conducted differently than tax and A and A? And we had a we had I think a similar question of like what metrics are you tracking for CAS specific firms? So if we can marry those two together, great. Um, but I'm, I'm you know I think there's this there's this question of you know when you think about CAS relative to other services, how how do you think about the measurement 
uh, of these of these services? Are they similar? Or are they different than than tax or A and A? Can I let you take that first too? Well, this may be the first time for me to be able to answer two questions that put into one, right? <laughs> we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. So, so I'm I'm simple minded. So you know, I look just as I provide financial statements to my clients and review them. I get financial statements that are provided to me on a monthly basis for for cash. And I look at gross margin. I look at operating income, and, and just like running a business, I'll be that simple. So, I mean, utilization, utilization is always important, but I look at my bottom line numbers and look at my top line numbers and look at my PPE and E and, and, and that's how I run the business. So, you know, I have my projections that we look at forecasting and budgeting just as we provide to our clients. I look at that as well. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, you can look at average rate you know, are you as an average is at $173 an, an hour or $200 an hour or whatever that may be. But the, at the end of the day, it comes down to bottom line for Purposely. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of metrics you can look at by verticals. You can look at growth. I um, mean, you can have look at uh, work being done in certain different locations. But at the end of the day, it's really gross gross profit in, in my bottom line. So that's that's how I look at it. Uh, how I think the other question, which was the same question, was that. Uh, how does tax and cast yeah. differ? Is that what I heard? Or yeah, so anyone to know if there's, it, it, you know, how how cast uh, uh, needs differ from tax and A and A. So, so I think though, from a cast perspective, yeah, the busy seasons are not part of of, of our cloth, right? So, if you think of tax and you think of assurance, you know, they're all working like crazy right now, or, and there's that ebb and flow, right? Mm -hmm. So, like July it's slow and. You know, they're all take, you know, taking it easy and they deserve that. But for, for us, it's a pretty steady. And, and of course, month end is higher, quarter end, year end. January is our toughest month, um, you know, 1099s and other things in year end. And uh, so so I think the quality of the individuals are pretty much the same. I mean, you just want folks that are that love to to interact with clients on, a, on the communication and on a daily basis to be able to to know that this is a client that's going to you're going to be talking to for every day almost for for years right so i think tax and audit has their way of doing things and, and which is fine but i think you you need folks that really want to get ingrained with the client and really learn and understand that and listen and help advise so um, i think tax planning and everything else is very important too but i think for cast is we really want to become an extension of their company extension of their team and we want to be part of their we i like to say if anybody invites us to their thanksgiving day at dinner then we know you're we're doing a good job but i we want people that really want to to be able to be more of the extrovert to be having those conversations and to build those relationships so yeah i guess that would be my answer i think this is a great question because i think firms really struggle with this new mindset it is a major mindset shift for firms to build a profitable cast practice um in that traditionally with audit and tax you're gathering the data and you're reporting on the data right and and that's sort of like you get it all and you report on it that's what you do in the cash space you're analyzing and advising and firms struggle on analyzing and advising <laughs> because they're used to reporting or in, and so it's a total mind shift um and i think you know, firms that really are trying to build out this advisory part of their practice are looking at profitability. And um, I'll give you an example. Like there are, I know some firms that are are kind trying to change their audit practice and they're challenging their audit partners when they get a possibly new audit client to say, okay, this is a $20,000 audit, but their books are a hot mess. And should we say our cast team could service you better looking at this mess and would that partner be willing to give up the audit because it could be a hundred twenty thousand dollar cast um you know it could be a ten thousand dollar month cast client and so that's more revenue to the firm than a twenty thousand dollar audit now audit partners don't like that because they're they want to grow their book of business but you know it's a mindset shift but what's best for the firm and also what's best for the client and I can give you the same example on the tax side, right? The, the tax side is, you know, firms are like, listen, there's a supply and demand thing happening. There are more businesses than bookkeepers and firms are turning bookkeeping work away, 
right? They're saying that we don't have the capacity, we don't have the time, and we're saying no, but we'll do your taxes. And we'll do your taxes for, you know, $2,000 a year. What? When it could be a $2,000 a month CAS client. <laughs> Um, and that could be $24,000 a year, but the firm hasn't built the cast machine. They have built the audit and tax machine. This is a new muscle. And that's why I get phone calls every single day about who do you know? I want to hire a cast leader like Kane that can come in here and knows how to build it. Who do you know? Right? It's the number one question I get is who do you know? We're looking to build cast. We want to bring in the talent that knows how to build it um, because it is a new muscle. And it's a total mindset shift. So I don't know if I fully answered the question, but that's um, just sort of adding to what Kane is saying. That's fantastic. Well, we we could we have even more questions. Maybe we'll have to do a follow up panel. Uh, it made me think you're talking about. Oh, people are always looking for people like Kane. I was like, Kane, is there a generative AI? Kane, is there Kane AI somewhere where somebody can hire a, a Kane to come in for their cast practice? Well, if if our audience wants to reach out, say thank you for coming on, follow your work. What is the best way for them to connect with with each one of you? Yeah, Janine, do you want to go? For sure. That? Yeah, I mean, I'm very passionate about helping firms build a cast practice. Um, I can talk to anybody all day long about this and very happy to, you know, help anybody as they're building this. So you can reach me. My email address is Deneen at Bachkeeper.com. Yeah. And thanks again, uh, you know, David, for the opportunity. Of, if you want to reach me, you can just you know message me on LinkedIn. It's probably the easiest uh, and I'll respond. So uh, happy to, uh, to have conversations. I, I do talk to a lot of folks, uh, you know, I know from a leadership, we do a lot of things, uh, around the, the country to really promote CAS. So I'm very passionate in general with the industry and how we're taking CAS to the next level. So happy to have conversations or ask, answer any questions. I'll do the best I can. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a great time to be in our industry. It's a perfect storm. We have uh, so many clients out there that need our services. And uh, if you can set it up right, I mean, it could go forever, right? It could be endless. So it's, uh, it's a great to be part of it and great again for having the time to talk today. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'll say thank you to both of you for coming on and for, for being so generous with your time. Um, I really encourage the audience to, to reach out to these folks, connect with them. We're going to do a follow up with their social handles, with their website. We've interviewed each one of them on our Growing Your Firm podcast. Deneen's, yours is already out. Kane, yours is coming, I think, later this quarter. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be out here soon. Uh, it, 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 folks, I know this wasn't really about Jetpack Workflow, but if you're interested in checking out our platform, if project management, task management, client management is a problem for you, I'm going to launch a little poll here just so we know where everybody is at. And again, if you if you need to connect with Kane, we will follow up. I encourage you to do so uh, as well as Deneen. Um, and I'll ask you both one final question. I know you're, you're you're both on the conference circuit. It feels like every I open up LinkedIn. You're speaking here. You're speaking there. So wh where's the next conference you're going to be at? Me? Go ahead. I'm I I will be at Sage Transform in a week. Um, typically I do, I do travel a lot, but I get a little bit of a break in January through April. <laughs> uh, and so during that tax season, the only conference I have in the next, you know, coming up is the Sage Transform. Will I see you there, Kane? I will not be there this year, but uh, I will be at there. the age uh, in Vegas in June. Yeah. So I'll be speaking uh, specifically on offshoring and some okay. of the challenges and the best practices in that. So, uh, but you know, I, I do go to a lot of leadership conferences, uh, you know, more on panel discussions. But I'm happy you just follow me. You'll see pictures of me. You see the I was in India, like I said, with my team and others. So happy to if you want to follow me or respond uh, or like me, please, you know, please do it. So. Fantastic. I won't be at Sage. There's a, I, I'm a coin flip right now for Engage. We have one of the, one of the partners mm -hmm. we're working with. They said, oh, well, we, look, we might, we might bring you up on stage. So he bring me on stage. I'm flying out, I'll I'm flying there. out to Vegas. I'll be there. But I'll, I'll be at the BDO conference in, in May. So hopefully I'll get to see uh, uh, both of you uh, sometime yeah. in person uh, this year. Well, I really appreciate everybody's time today. Um, happy, happy Thursday. Again, appreciate you both for being on and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, David. Thank Bye, everyone. Bye. All right. Take care.